Hello and welcome to the Frontington and Backwards Railway, and this time it's alive! In my last video I finished laying the track for the main loop. The next step is getting power to all that track so that I can actually run trains on it, and that's what this video is all about. I had actually already begun wiring, starting with the fiddle yard, so that I could check the DCC setup was working. So the next step was to extend that to the rest of the layout. My DCC command station is an Arduino Mega running DCC++ EX. For now I've popped it in this little cardboard box I had lying around, as it happened to be the perfect size. To send commands to the Arduino, I'm using JMRI running on an old laptop, and to make life a little bit easier I'm using an app called Engine Driver on an old phone to connect wirelessly to JMRI via the laptop's Wi-Fi hotspot. The USB cable between the laptop and the Arduino not only allows them to communicate, but also powers the Arduino. The Arduino then wears a hat, in this case a motor controller shield, which takes the DCC instructions from the Arduino and sends that to the track. For that, the motor shield needs its own power supply, and the cheap Laze DCC decoder I've got specifies a maximum voltage of 12 volts, so that's what I'm using. So out of the box come these two bus wires. I'm using slightly thicker wire for the bus wires, as apparently that helps, and at various convenient points I'm breaking out of that bus using a terminal strip and connecting the dropper wires from the track. The idea is to keep the droppers as short as practically possible, maximising the use of that thicker wire. Extending the wiring to the rest of the layout was fairly straightforward as it happens. The first board we get to is the non-scenic one, so for ease of access I decided to put the wiring on top of the board instead of underneath. But the principle is the same. DCC bus as far as the breakout terminal strip, and then dropper wires to the track. I've got two points here, both of which were reclaimed from my previous layout. The furthest one is a set track second radius insel frog point, so it's nice and simple to wire up. The other point though is electrofrog, so I needed to consider polarity switching, and after a bit of research I opted to use a gauge master autofrog, as it's cheap. You can buy more expensive alternatives, but I didn't want to. Wiring it up is dead easy. We need power to the outer rails, and the autofrog unit provides power to the middle, switching polarity automatically depending on what's needed. At least it's meant to. At first it wouldn't switch polarity, so when the loco got to the point, it just stopped. After a bit of head scratching I finally consulted the instructions and noticed that the operating voltage started at 12 volts. So out of curiosity I tested the power output of my 12 volt power supply with a multimeter, to find that in reality it was only 10 volts. Well, no wonder it wasn't working. Fortunately I had a 15 volt power supply knocking around in a box, so I swapped that in and the autofrog started working. If you listen carefully, you can just about hear the autofrog's relay clicking when the loco goes over the point, but it's hardly noticeable. The Lay's DCC decoder hasn't complained so far about having 15 volts, but it's something I'll need to watch out for, I suppose. If it goes up in smoke, that might be the reason why. Moving on to the rest of the layout, the DCC bus has been extended along the inside of the subframe, again with breakout terminal strips, except this time I've used these handy plugs so that I can easily disconnect each board from the bus when I need to remove it. The underside of each board is where the majority of the wiring is. On my old layout I had to crawl around underneath it to do my wiring, which was awkward, and uncomfortable, and dark and made me never want to touch the wiring again. But with this new layout each board can be removed individually, stood up on a workbench or a table, 
and I can work on the wiring in comfort. And the result is that the wiring is so much tidier and more precise. I'm really pleased with how easy it was to do and how neat it looks. My biggest challenge actually was figuring out how to attach the terminal blocks to the board because I couldn't find any screws small enough to go through the little holes. But in the end I used double-sided tape and that seems to be working fine so far. With everything wired up, I can finally send my tank engine round to see whether A it blows up, or B it derails. And the good news is that I'm getting reliable power to all parts of the track, and those auto frogs are doing a wonderful job. And as you can see, this tank engine is staying on the track too. At least in this direction. In the opposite direction, it's not such a happy story. The first problem area I've uncovered is here at the join from the non-scenic board 1 to the back of board 2. And for some reason the 5600 keeps losing its trailing wheels at that point. To the eye everything looks to be lining up fine, but clearly there's something misaligned there. Hopefully I'll just need to fine tune the position of the ends of the track slightly. The more significant problem area is the curve at the other end of the layout. Bending the flexi track to second radius wasn't easy, and although I secured the track firmly either side of the join, when I cut the track the ends sprang back out of shape. They just prefer to be straight I guess. The result is that I've got a sharp kink just there, and my 5600 just doesn't like it. It may just be this loco, but I'm not going to take that risk. Now is the best time to fix this, before I go any further. So I carefully ripped up the track and attempted to relay it. I had fixed the track here with some strong wood glue to try and correct the kink, but it hadn't worked, and just made getting the track back up that much harder. Fortunately I could reuse the flexi track I had, reposition it and add the new dropper wires. I did try soldering the track to some screw heads, like you're supposed to, but I don't think I had the right sort of screws and it wasn't particularly successful. And while the join over the board was certainly better, I ended up with another nasty kink here instead. So in the end I ripped it all up again, and ordered some set track second radius curves instead. I guess the lesson here is that if you need your track to be second radius, by second radius track. Flexi track is great, but it has its limits. And the great thing about this is that the geometry is guaranteed, and these two pieces here will form a 90 degree turn, ending exactly on the join in my board. No cutting of track required.
the transition across the join is just a matter of making sure the ends line up, and the rest sorts itself out. And I can still add those bits of cork under one side to give me some cant on the curve. I fixed the alignment on the other join too. Fortunately it was just a case of tweaking the position of the rails, which is easily done by loosening the screws, adjusting and retightening. And now it's lovely and smooth, and the loco isn't complaining anymore. So the rest of the boards go back in place too. And finally, I can test the whole layout again. I'm really pleased to report that it's all silky smooth now. No derailing, no nasty grinding noises, no buffer lock, no electrical problems. Bizarre! I'm sure you'll agree there's something very satisfying about watching a train trundle around, so I might just do that for a while. That's all for this episode, thanks for joining me. As always, I appreciate your support, however you choose to show it. There's a list of links in the notes below if you're interested. I had a few comments on my last video about how the countersunk screws were pushing the sleepers apart, which I was aware of, but it's great to know that other people noticed too, and cared enough to mention it. So if there's anything about this video that you like, or would do differently, let me know great to keep up the conversation. But that's all for now, thanks for watching. <laughs>